You are listening to the Gritty Podcast, where we talk about all things gritty. Welcome to the Gritty Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Call, and I am joined today by Brad Hunt. And today's podcast is about Jeremiah Johnson, Mm -hmm. or Liver Eating Johnson. And it's a book, it's actually, uh, uh, that we're going to go over. It's called The Crow Killer. The Saga of Liver Eating Johnson, and um, we're we're going to read through this book in a series of podcasts. It's probably going to be 10 one-hour shows, maybe 15 one-hour shows. Mm-hmm. It depends on what it takes to get through through this, but Brad's never read this book. Nope. I read it years ago, and I've read it multiple times. I've listened to it in my ear. It's buds. been on the list, but it has, I've been listening to the terminal list. Like, why would yeah, I call yeah. you a book killer? I've listened to this. You know, up on the mountain, it's just intriguing. It's a mountain man story. Mm-hmm. You hear about uh, Native Indians, uh, Native Americans. You hear about mountain men, what they went through, what they did. This u- book is a little more unique because I read um, a number of books that are biogra- mm-hmm. more biographical, like yeah, Daniel right. Boone, uh, a biography, which is really good. We'll get into that book on a future date. been wanting to read that, too. But... What we have here is more of the legend of Jeremiah Johnson. It's a collection of oral stories. There's not a lot of written accounts. No yeah. one took wrote the book down. Like this was captured over from lots of sources over the years from different people who were interested in Jeremiah Johnson. But unlike some other characters like Boone, where people actually wrote extensive histories and factual accounts of what happened. Yeah. This is more who's out there, you know, this man, Jeremiah Johnson is out in the wilderness. Could be tall tales. Yeah. Or I mean, <laughs> real true. And it, it sounds like there are tales because there are some events that are factual. And then we know for, you know, from stories told that it, it's not quite Yeah, the story. What I mean is the stories grow over time mm-hmm. is what happens. But it does give us a glimpse. Um, these stories are pretty neat. I think the book is really interesting. And take it for what it is. I mean, sometimes it's like, did half of what they said happen? Yeah. Um, or or was it, um, you know, even if half of what they said is true, it's amazing, let alone um, if, it, if it's mostly true. So there's some crazy stories that we're going to read in this book. Um, so join us for that. It's the next uh, 10 or 15 parts. Mm-hmm. We'll see what, how it goes. If you like what we do on this series... Uh, Leave us a comment, like, subscribe to the channel, uh, support us. We we like to put out these sort of book podcasts when we leave town, and we are about to leave town. Yep. So we want to still provide you guys with something to listen to while we're out, something useful and interesting while we're out hunting. We'll be gone for the next five to six weeks, so that's what we're going to do. We're going to run these shows during that period, and uh, I think um, some of y'all will find it really interesting. If not... Check back with us when we get done with yeah, the season. Yeah, exactly. Uh, if you like, if you want to support us, um, support us by shopping at Peaks Equipment. Use the code Gritty over there. We got trekking poles. They have uh, the headlamps, um, gators, yep. Yep. other stuff being brought to the market all the time. What else, Brad? We got uh, stealthy, stealthy nutrition, stealthy nutrition, yep. CBD oil, sleep gummies, um, rifle covers. Glassing there's pads. a lot. I mean, there, there's e charge. There's a whole list of things that yeah, you know, electrolytes, health, everything. It's all there. So go check that out uh, at Stealthy, and uh, use the code Gritty over at Mountain Ops. Yep. Um, replenish that ignite supply, uh, blaze shots, get a merino hoodie, whatever. Yep. All right, Brad. Let's get into this story. So I'm going to go over a little bit of the forward here, and uh, give you guys a little taste of of what this book is about. It says the forward is by Richard D. Dorson. He says the spine tingling and blood curdling narrative, this spine tingling and blood curdling narrative should intrigue historians and folklorists for its method as much as it stirs the general reader for its drama. We have here, what we have here is the skeletal biography of a Rocky mountain trapper and Indian fighter in the middle decades of the 19th century retold primarily on the basis of word of mouth sources. Oral history as practiced today by historical scholars is first an elite history dealing with prominent figures deemed worthy of interviews and second, 
a record of the living. But many Americans whose experiences are worth preserving are neither famous nor alive. Their annals belong to what may be called folklore history or saga in the Icelandic sense of family and local chronicles maintained by spoken recitals and filled, like all enduring oral relations, with marvelous matter. The history of liver eating Johnson has been kept going on by this sort of saga. So you can see it kind of sets the tone where these men didn't write necessarily. You know, their adventures were told to one another. They traveled with one another. Later, when they were in their old age, they wrote their stories down. Mm -hmm. But what you're going to see here is that kind of story being told. Yep. Um, he says uh, later in this forward, he says, here is the personal history of liver eating Johnson from 1847 to his death in 1900. To put it in contrast, Boone was... Daniel Boone was, um, he was two years younger than George Washington. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you're talking 17, mid 1700s where the Quakers had kind of landed here. You're dealing with the very, very early colonial times. Yep. The French and the English were still fighting over things. Benjamin Franklin was was around when Daniel Boone was there. And then Daniel Boone, com Boone comes through the Cumberland Batch uh, uh, Cumberland Pass or whatever yep. f discovers um, a gap in the App Appalachian Mountains comes in and and then starts to cause westward expansion. But you're talking yep. about so a hundred years earlier right. than this. Yep. So here you are, mid 1800s, um, talking about the West. You're talking about the gunfighter days of yeah. You're talking I mean, Wyatt Earp. Uh, these are these are hard men. You know, yeah, hard times this too. Is, this is real early too, like eighteen forty-seven to yep. his death in nineteen hundred. So fifty-three years. Um, and I think he died at age I don't remember sixty something. Mm -hmm. So we shall never know the full and exact facts in the saga of John Johnson, but we can sure uh, we can be sure that the legend is honest, uncontaminated by hucksters and journalists and conforming to the classic patterns of heroic tradition. Like other strong heroes, from Her uh, Heracles to Tom Hitch <laughs> Hickathrift, Johnson is... Uh, Jan Johnson is... Uh, what's it say here? Matchless. My iPhone is busted. Right oh. there. <laughs> Johnson is matchless in his physique, endurance, strength, and resolution. His fellow mountain men, 49ers on their way to the gold fields, traders and soldiers in the western forts, all talked of his immense frame and the power of his hands and feet, with which he could twist off a man's neck or kick him high in the air. True to the conventions of the heroic age, the liver eating constantly the liver eater constantly engaged in single combat. With the twenty crows who individually pursued him, with the treacherous Ute who betrayed his force uh, to the Nez Perce, with Sam Grant, the Negro cowboy, with uh, Assiniboine, Assiniboine, the Assiniboine Indian who had shot his friend Arkansas Pete, whenever he had his opponent at a disadvantage, the liver eater granted him equal or even favoring terms, giving him first draw or tossing him a knife and then crushing him with a kick and a blow, like Beowulf and... Uh, uh, what were, how do you say that? Kuka Klan? Kuka Klan? Uh, he grappled with monsters and beat off a grizzly bear and mountain lion in a cave with the frozen leg he had wrenched off of a Blackfoot Indian. His stamina is seen in his 200-mile escape from the Blackfoot village to his own cabin half-naked in a freezing snowstorm. A feat suggestive of another mountain man, Marvel, the return of Hugh Glass, mauled by a bear and left for dead by his companions in the wilderness, crawling hundreds of miles through Indian country to Fort Kiowa. And for those of us who have seen... Um, the Revenant. Yeah. You get sort of a mm -hmm. glimpse of that time and 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 that story. Hugh Glass gets mauled by a bear, gets left for dead by his companions, yep. and then crawls his way back. It seems impossible, but he does it. So you're talking about those kinds of stories. Um from you're gonna find out as we get through the book that Jeremiah Johnson or John Johnston is a big man. Yeah, right. Um 
I mean, big, like white ginger if, Viking type yeah, dude. If he's he's if he's trying to even out the fight, you know, throwing the guy yeah. a knife, and he's like, you know, he's a tough sob. Yeah, he's legendary in that way. What's interesting is a lot of these trappers don't live very long. Yeah, most of these people don't make That's it. A hard, they're living hard lives. And so I what's mean, Boone is the same way. It's like yep. some of these guys die in their old age, and you're like, how? Right? How? Obviously, in order to have survived the conditions and the places they went to and how they did these things, you had to have a certain luck. Yeah. Sure, sure, I'm sure. But some of it had to be just well, absolute. I, I mean, they are, yeah, I keep going back to it, but they're hard At some men. point, at some point I had somebody say the other day, like, I want to say that, like, Lampers shot that elk, you know, at point blank. And mm-hmm. the, I want to say that Lampers just gets lucky. But after a while... You got to stop saying that. Yes, and I think it's the same here with uh, Jeremiah Johnson. At some point, you're like, just the fact that he he trapped where he trapped right. and then made it through, yep. just says something about the man being well, spectacularly. With different. all the experience that you're getting, and and you know, going back to Lampers or whatever, but he's had so much experience that he knows how to put himself in those situations that are where luck may have it is going to yeah. come his way. This is no different. So the reason they call him liver eating Johnston, we're going to get into here, um, liver eating John, John Johnson. We're going to get into that. Um, you know, if you guys have watched the, the Jeremiah Johnson video with, mm-hmm. uh, um, Robert, Robert Redford, Redford yep. back in the day. Yep. And if you haven't seen that, you're a young kid and you haven't seen it, you got to go, go check watch it out. It. But, um, it's that story, like all these Indians, the, there's the legend has it, the story has it that the crow grabbed 20 warriors. They, they set them up to come after him one yep. by one over like a 10 year period or five. I don't remember how long. Um, and, uh, he ends up surviving every single one of them because of this sort of blood feud that they had yep. going on because they murder his, someone he cared about. So yep. we're going to get into, into that here. Um, and uh, we're just going to get right into chapter one here. You got a little taste, a little preface of what we're dealing with. So I'm going to jump in. Um, what the book, what what they did want to say is, you know, how do we know what we know? Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to just briefly read that just so there's more context for mm-hmm. y'all. Like this isn't entirely made up just like yeah. somebody said it. Um, Del Gu told much of this story as Johnson's partner. Dell shared many of his ex- of his experiences as a good talker and good listener. Dell heard and sorted out what many other mountain men had seen of Johnson. Some of Dell's stories clearly came first from Indian narrators, flatheads eager to tell what vengeance they had uh, helped Johnson wreak upon the crows, and crows determined that their own pr- proud uh, action against him be known. And then Dell knew all all this uh, mountain country himself. He had the mountain man's precise memory of topography, and for the step by step tactics any given terrain had inspired in whites and Indians battling for their lives, the study of such was both ruling intellectual interest and uh, provision against one's own moments of hazard. Finally, Dell had much of the story from J- Johnson himself. For so he. You basically, Dell got a lot of this information from mm-hmm. other people, other Indians he spoke to, other tribesmen, and being there himself, being familiar with the land. Finally, Dell had uh, much of the story from Johnson himself because they hunted and they yeah. were partners and yep. they told each other things. For even the taciturn liver eating uh, Johnson took to reminiscing in his later years of a long winter's night, and he had all uh, and he had all along been willing to fill in for Dell such details of the action. Uh, or his own strategy as Dell could not see for himself. So, yeah. So he gets a lot of this from there. There's, there's military records cause he fought in the civil war yep. after the civil war. He serves again later in the military. Um, so there's records of him there. He actually is buried in like the Arlington cemetery or something. Yeah, he, I'm not sure. The last two weeks of his life, he ends up um, dying in a veteran hospital. Cause he's just older than mm-hmm. old. And then they bury him in a, in a, in the, uh, veterans hospital graveyard. So, um, so there's records of, this isn't some fictional character. This is a real person. Um, and, uh, they say, I think he's, he, he ate people's, he ate liver of anyone he killed basically. 
Um, no thanks. You all can keep liver. There's many witnesses <laughs> of this. He killed an Indian. He plucked out that liver and he ate it. So we'll get into some of that. But I mean, that makes you dang unique. That's for yeah. Sure. <laughs> I don't even eat the liver off an animal. I'm sorry. We'll do some pills like Dude. Ryan does, but. <laughs> I don't care how much you soak it in milk. It doesn't taste good. <laughs> it's pretty wild, dude. Uh, anyway, you're going to enjoy this story, so stick with us. Um, I'm not the best reader, so, you know, that chicken's in the background. Shut up. Um, but um, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. We did the River of Doubt, and, and a lot of people seem to like that mm-hmm. with Theodore Roosevelt. So we're going to try it again here, and hopefully you guys enjoy this book. All right. Chapter 1, The Making of a Legend. On May morning in 1847, Crow Indians killed and scalped John Johnston's pregnant wife. For many years thereafter, he killed and scalped Crow Indians. Then he ate their livers raw. Hmm. He ate them not for hunger's sake, but upon principle. Just what principle? His whole life's history may suggest. Other tribes than the Crows could arouse his anger. The Blackfeet indeed once shamed and mistreated him, their captive. But one tribe only did Johnston dreadfully humiliate he was uh dapiek uh, absaroka the killer of crows hmm. as such he was feared his fame served him almost as a weapon indians ambushing him with every tactical advantage broke and ran when he killed but one of them as crow killer he might expect captivity and therefore the chance to escape when taken by other tribes who would naturally hope to sell him dear to his special foes On other occasions, as an awesome ally, Johnston could turn tribe against tribe and take for himself, in the warfare that followed, a highly profitable harvest of scalps. His first insane lust for revenge was surely real. Whether provoked by the death of one he loved or by mere hurt to his pride, but the reputation it brought him was to become an extraordinary business asset. As John Johnston, the, tr- the young trapper, had already won a name for his strength and quick, leaning, uh, quick learning of wilderness ways. Force and cunning, however, were mere details in his new repute as liver-eating Johnson, one whom the Indians could consider as obsessed divinely or divinely mad. John Johnston talked but little, and this added to his fearsome personality. He was known as as surly, uncommunicative, and mistrustful. Yet, from the beginning, he was willing to talk, when necessary, to set the record straight and inform his companions of things they could not see for themselves. He fell in first with old John Hatcher, a famous but loquacious trapper who admired him and delighted to spread stories about him. In some of these first stories, Johnston was portrayed as simply being the greenhorn, he had been cheated by that sly trader Joe Robido, and he had allowed Hatcher to steal upon him at his campfire apparently unobserved. Yet, as the same stories went on, somehow the Greenhorn had beat Robido in a horse trade and had seen more quickly than Hatcher that a supposedly deadly Indian was actually alive, ready to leap upon them. Hmm. So, the stories change a little yeah. bit. You have conflicting, you know, they kind of grow a little bit. But that's probably due to the fact that as a rookie, you're one way. Yeah. Later, you become more accomplished, and it's hard to see that person as a rookie. Right. Johnston chose as his Johnson. long... Johnson chose... They they use both intermittently. They do? Johnston, Johnson. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think it's, you know, I think it's back in those Old days... English type stuff. Yeah, yeah. They kind of used it both ways. Mm-hmm. Um because gotcha. it says stories first. Johnston was portrayed okay. as simply Greenhorn. Then it says Johnson. I figured you were terrible at reading. No. And then no. it says Johnson shows <laughs> as his longtime partner. You yeah. know, it goes back and forth yeah, throughout okay. the book. I just want to clarify that. And then they say him John, Jeremiah, and then they call him John Johnson, John John, Jeremiah, yeah. or you know. And so it kind of bounces around as far as names go. Yeah. Right. Gotcha. I think we'll find out later what's officially in his in his, his uh, in his army records, mm-hmm. you know, military records. Johnson chose as longtime partner a trapper even more concerned with spreading his fame, Del Gu. Del, though, as he put it, in, uh, he knew. Uh, it's hard to read this, by the way, because it's an old book, right. and they write it like trappers. Yeah, and uh, they didn't have the most flowing English. Some farmers like me. <laughs> this is like <laughs> hard to read. 
Uh, Del, so he falls in with Del Gu. Del, though, as he put it, um, knew not when to ask questions. Uh, did manage to obtain answers necessary to the legend. Dell went along with Johnson on his pilgrimage pilgrimages to the cabin of John Morgan's feared widow, Crazy Woman. So remember Crazy Woman? Mm. Kind of, not really. Okay. Um, she lives forever by herself, and she's a, she's mad. Okay. Okay. After she is like her husband, like we'll get into it, but the the Indians like slaughter her and her family in front of her. Okay. And, yeah, yeah, and yeah, just, yeah, 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 yeah. Then she yeah. just lives there, and so her name is Crazy Woman, as known by the Indians. Um, and uh, she just stayed there. So she's friends with Jeremiah Johnson, though. Dell witnessed the killing of the last of the 20 warriors. So he, he witnessed crazy woman and he witnessed the 20 warriors. The last one who tried to kill him of Mm -hmm. the, of the crows who had made a pact to, uh, get him. Um, the last of the, of the warriors whom the crows dedicated, especially to Johnson's destruction. Dell was not ashamed to relate his own, uh, queasiness when livers were plucked out and devoured. He also lived to tell his story even after Johnson's death of old age in the middle 1880s. And again, in 1900, he told it to J.F. Anderson, white eye. So Del Gu, who was his partner and probably spent more time with him than most, Mm -hmm. like told the stories to others. The materials for legend were surely ready to hand. John Johnson's shrewdness and fantastic strength were, of course, the natural attributes of a liver-eating Johnson. Crazy woman's shrill keening for her dead each night came come sundown was as uh, his chorus of the fates. His unfortunate enemies, the crows, were tribesmen generally admired for their wisdom and dignity and their very marking of 20 heroes to seek vengeance individually against one Dapiek ha- uh, has in it their own sense of high drama. Um, Johnson's associates, two mountain men who, uh, with whom given the opportunity joined in his feuding, set off the crow killers, bloody history with their own eccentricities. You get to know the characters in this book, dude. It was a wild yeah. freaking time. Right. These men were nuts. The Indians were nuts. The white men were nuts right. and they were nuts together. Like everybody trying to kill everybody. Like and- you're talking, they, I was doing some math on some of the men in this book. On average, they killed about five men a year. Well, after 50 years, do the math. Ah, you're turning 50 guys dude, dude, in the dirt. Dead Bye. people you've killed. And it's most of it's gruesome because it's, it's close combat. Oh, yeah. And, you know, the, and the death, it's... a lot of it is like, uh, like a half-white, half-Indian mm-hmm. person who doesn't fit in either one, kind of gets vengeful, and then just... Just goes off and murders any Indian. Right. Like they had Indian hunters, they just killed Indians, and then Indians killed. They had Indians who had also the same thing. Any white person, yeah, they were out to murder. Yep. I mean, it was pretty vengeful on both sides. It was it was a very violent. Like I said, it's very violent. I mean, it is. I mean, the strongest survived. Yes. Right. Yes. So, um, let's see. Getting back to the book, it says. Uh, mountain men who, when given the opportunity, joined in this feuding, set off the crow killer's bloody history with their own eccentricities. As background against which the liver eaters' exploits might be savored and judged, there was the tradition of the private grudge. Should a trapper, beset already by unending work and uh, harrowing danger, choose to run still further risk of bullet, tomahawk, or even the stake, certainly there was no one to deny him that privilege." So basically, if if someone wronged you, then there was the law of vengeance and mm-hmm. and stuff that they they would go through and they go out of their way because if someone got away with hurting you or going after you, then that just meant the next guy thought he could do the same right. thing. Yep. So part of it was being ruthless. That way, people knew not to mess with you. It's kind of like the kid at the playground. You know, if you let everybody bully you, they just continue to do that. Mm-hmm. And it's like punch him in the nose and he won't do it anymore. Shoot a trapper. Um, so it says, liver eating Johnson was not the first in frontier history to take a trail of vengeance against the Indians, though possibly the most spectacular. Blackjack of the Juanita, Juaniata and Louis Wetzel won special renown for such vendettas, and there were others of the vengeful Nick of the Woods type, too, too many uh, by far to mention here. Surely, as mere killer of Indians, mere bloody bearded eater of red men's livers, the crow killer would be worth little investigation. 
We could easily dismiss him as, a inhu- as hu- inhumane or insane. But he was not simply inhumane or insane. He was not even simply cruel. He cannot be so easily understood. Rather, we may see him stepping back from the barbarities of others of his kind, almost as if they offended his sense of order. They, in turn, at times, seem more troubled by his choice of liver than by his mere cannibalism. (laughs) And though Johnson did express the generalized contempt of his era in regard to Indians, we shall observe repeatedly his very real respect for warriors of many tribes. Even as in his heyday, he was above all the killer of crows, a time did arrive in his ver- uh, terrible vendetta when, in sheer admiration of crow magnanimity, he ceased his dreadful feuding and became their brother-in-arms. He They showed some concern for um, Crazy Woman, yep. and so then he decided to forgive the vendetta, and it was over. Yep. Um, late, uh, the hair merchants. What do you think that refers to, Brad? Well, hose. A little scalping? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like. <laughs> uh. Late in the afternoon of, uh, of a quiet autumn day in 1843, the steamer Thames up from St. Louis swung around into the famous landing eddy at St. Joseph. Uh, a blue haze of Indian summer stretched from the far off Rocky Mountain across the prairie to the Missouri. Um, and I'm going to skip ahead, but basically, um, he, Jeremiah Johnson arrives in 1843 and into the Rocky Mountains. And here he is, and he is in St. Louis. So what is that, Missouri? Mm-hmm. Um, not quite the Rocky Mountains, but um, he shows up and he gets into a little scuffle with some people in the street. And then... <clears throat> He, um, they know not to mess with him because he's a little bit intense. He's about 20 years old. He goes into the store, and this is where he runs into Robido. Okay? And Robido is kind of a famous, shrewd businessman who w- w- will, um, will get his, will rob his own son. Mm-hmm. Okay? Right. And he shows up, and he ends up spending some money, and he buys. Um, gear and equipment. He buys uh, some traps, a rifle. Uh, he ends up getting screwed over a little bit on some of it. He buys a Hawken. Um, in fact, Hawken sent him there. The inventor of the rifles okay. yep. sends yeah. him there to buy one from Robido. Robido has him in the supply shop. So John or, my, or John Johnson buys the rifle. Um, he buys a bunch of other stuff. He gets traps. He gets he pays too much for them. Whatever, um, and then um, he says, "Where can I go find some good land to trap on?" And a bunch of people in the town and some some native people are like, oh, "Over here is really good. Go over there." Uh, so, uh, old John Hatcher. Uh, so it says, by mid morning, mounted on his on the Comanche pony. This is the the horse he just mm-hmm. bought in town and with his possibles packed behind uh, his treeless Cheyenne saddle, Johnson was on his way. Old Joe watching him leave chuckled as he pocketed his spoils, Joe Robido. So that's how the story starts, right? Can you imagine riding across the country without a, a saddle without a tree? No, that'd be so uncomfortable. <laughs> like, <laughs> there's no way. <sighs> so he says, old John Hatcher was in blue, big blue country. By sheer accident. So John Hatcher is a more uh, experienced trapper. Right, and yeah. This is the first person that he ends up um, trapping with. Yep. Jeremiah Johnson. John Johnson. He, uh, it says, he had set out from Independence with an enormous caravan for Santa Fe, not in order to trade, not to help protect the 175 wagons that crossed the plains, but simply to visit with old cronies. At the Council Grove, he left the train and set off due north toward the Platte. As he approached the Big Blue, he saw uh, somehow sensed or somehow sensed human activity below the riverbank. A large kingfisher, usually the most wary of birds, sat so low on the branches of a small cottonwood and so engrossed by whatever was going on down by the stream as not to see the approaching horseman. Hmm. Hatcher, with acumen developed in hundreds of ticklish situations, dead reined his horse on the prairie, dismounted, and circled around on foot so as to surprise both the sentinel bird and the object of its interest. To young Johnson, 
Bending over beneath the bank as he prepared a trap set, the voice of the mountain man came like a clap of thunder. Cuss me for a Kiowa, but your back makes a good target for a red Indian. <laughs> Johnson froze as uh, Johnson Johnson froze as its fame as a sentinel belied. The kingfisher emitted its raucous cry and sailed from the cottonwood. He spooked the bird. Mm-hmm. A man uh, may be a greenhorn, but be possessed of intuition. And somehow the young trapper knew not to compromise his life by reaching out for his rifle. Instead, he turned slowly and faced his accoster. The latter stood above him at the edge of the prairie, holding his hawk and rifle loosely, but with the muzzle staring at Johnston and the hammer drawn. In large outline against the afternoon sky, Johnston saw the very picture of a mountain man. Long blonde hair hung well below Hatcher's shoulders. A heavy beard of the same hue graced his ruddy countenance. Over six feet in height and weighing well over 200 pounds, he was dressed in the best cured buckskin from Blackfoot Tanners, beaded and fringed with crow finery. His moccasins were of Cheyenne make, and the beaded rim of his beaver cap was Shoshone craftsmanship. From his belt of buffalo hide hung a hatchet, a bowie knife, a powder horn, and a metal ring for holding scalps. Even as Johnston was taking all of this in, the mountain man let down the hammer of his rifle and leaped the 10 feet to the river shore. I thought we were talking about lampers, but then I said over 200 pounds. I'm like, never mind. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> what are you uh, doing, our son? <laughs> he asked and put forth a brawny hand. Johnston led the older man's gaze uh, to his trap and then explained, I heard uh, in St. Joe uh, trapping's good hereabouts. Hatcher laughed loud and long. That's a good one, he said. This place were uh, clean trapped out before 25. So years ago, it had uh, been trapped out. He looked hard at Johnston, studied the greenhorn, uh, the greenhorn victim of Robodeau's practical joke, uh, and saw in him, greenhorn or no, a likely partner. Kicking at the trap with disdain, he said, Come along, we, me, lad, but leave these things here. Uh, where we are going, we makes our own traps. Hmm. So, um, he already got screwed over for paying too much. Now he's just going to leave him there. <laughs> <laughs> he next turned to Johnston's horse. He inspected the animal very carefully, raising each foot in turn and watching the reflexes, looking at the teeth and stepping back at last to watch in admiration as the pony danced about. Wonders come and wonders go, he said. Now, how come? How come it old Joe sold ye a sound and fiery hoss such as this? The two partners uh, ate boiled jer- jerked venison that night. They sat by a campfire in the vastness of the plains, and Hatcher, ever willing to talk, spoke of mountain men and mountain ways. Johnson listened and even asked a few questions. Perhaps his uh, n- native dourness was the l- less evident in the presence of so much wisdom. When morning came, and they rode into the west. Hatcher pointed to his partner's uh, pre- present from Robodeau, the auto tomahawk. Don't, uh, don't use it unless you have to, he said. And then observing Johnson's astonishment, added, spoils the scalp. Uh, dressed scalps, he averred, brought big money on the English market. Hmm. The young trapper wanted to know why. Hangs them up in their parlors, spec so, Hatcher surmised. So it's interesting. You'll find as we read the book, there's a whole culture around scalps. Yeah. Like they like go out of their way to groom them, get them all clean, nice looking, shine them up. Like, I mean, I mean, and then they sell these scalps and decorate it. These are people's, these are human scalps. They're, scalps. They're treating them like a a an animal pelt, yeah. You know, prepping it and it's crude, man. Oh man, um, our so he's gotten so soft. <laughs> to this. I don't know. Civilization has its oh, perks. Man. They pressed hard for the mountains, since according to the mountain man, it was the utmost importance that they arrive in you went to count country before snows piled up in the divide. Uh, they made camp only when darkness fell upon the prairie and were up and breakfasted and on their way each day long before sunrise. When on the trail, Hatcher was as silent and uncommunicative as an Indian. 
He kept his nose to the wind and his eyes along the skyline. At night, however, when all had been snugged, with the horses safely staked nearby, he spilled his wilderness lore as from a flowing fountain. Hmm. Johnston took it all in as they lay quietly, feet to the fire, and shoulders propped against their Indian saddles. Alas, remember, young lad, Hatcher told him repeatedly, ye must never give a red coon a chance. Or again, alas, be the the first uh, to count coup. Otherwise, you'll be nowhere. Johnson was soon enough to prove that he could follow such good advice. For long in the middle of one afternoon, as they were entering the foothills, a dozen Arapahoes swept down upon them. At the first fire, Johnston caught an arrow in the flesh of his right shoulder. Oof. But despite this, he felled one of the attackers while Hatcher drowned two before the others fled out of rifle range. The young trapper started forward for the, co- for the, co- for the coup, but found himself pre- uh, peremptorily halted. We'll get that arrow out first, he said, said Hatcher, and with his bowie knife he removed it, along with a quantity of flesh. Johnston stood stoically the while. Now cuss me for a Kiowa, said the mountain man. Uh, Haven't ye got no feelings? Hmm. (laughs) Uh, That stun was, that, that arrow was deep. Johnston's only reply was to load his rifle. Never come up on a dead engine with an unloaded gun, Hatcher had taught him. They advanced, leading their horses toward the fallen Indians. Hatcher took advantage of the occasion to expound upon Arapaho character. These red Indians, he said, are treacherous are, are treacherouser than most. <laughs> like I said, it's not easy to read. One is still a living, his partner told him. For answer, Hatcher drew his bowie, and as Johnston pointed, the wounded brave attempted to draw his scalping knife. He was too late. The mountain man's blade was buried to his hilt, to the hilt in his chest. Now, said Hatcher, let's get on. He sank his bowie into the soft earth and pulled it out again, cleaning and uh, clean and bright. Coolly, he placed one moccasined foot on the victim's face, then reached down and twisted the scalp lock around one hand, slowly, for Johnson to see. Now, with the point of his knife, he made a quick circle around the base of the top knot and yanked upward. The scalp came off cleanly, with a snap like that of a whip, of whiplash, whirling it around several times to clean it of excess gore. Hatcher deftly slipped the top knot through the ring of his belt, pulling it until the bloody side faced the sky. Dries quicker this way, he said. Now let's see you try one. Hmm. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that that's hard to really put into context. Like thinking about that, I mean, he's like, I'm step on this guy's face, and I'm gonna scalp him. I'm gonna scalp him. I mean, know? you're talking about a totally different time. Um, Taking an arrow to the to the chest and pulling it out with a big Bowie knife, yeah. and then um, it's gruesome. Yeah, maybe. I mean, you'll find as we get through the book, like this is nothing. Yeah, right. I'm sure. I'm and it's sure. hard to fathom because we don't live in such barbaric times. Right. You know, 100%. And, and it's like, that was a human being. Mm-hmm. You just, you just pop their scalp off. Like it's like, like you just, and it really is, rabbit. you know, it's like a lot, a lot of this is survival. I mean, it's life or death, you know, it, throughout all of, all but of there were those West. who were dead set against some, yes. something like scalping. And then those that weren't right. Yes. What was it? Like what, there's a whole value and a lore to scalps yes. and they mean something. Yep. And, you know, I watched terror on the prairie the mm-hmm. other day with Gina Carano mm-hmm. and the dude has all the scalps on his saddle, yep. just sitting there. These like, it seems like a morbid, you know, I, I, I still am trying to figure, I, I can say like, I am in a different time period. Yeah. But, you know, before I go and judge, I got to put myself at a different time. Oh yeah. And in this time period, it's warrior to warrior. Correct. These guys tried to kill them. They killed them. Right. They keep the scalps. Right. It's like, there's it is every, every <laughs> move you're making, whether it's a predator, bear, wolf, whatever it may be yeah. trying to kill you. If that's not trying to kill you, then your human's trying to kill you. What's interesting is that the scalps are worth so much money, mm-hmm. especially like, and you know that because there's bounties on Indians yeah. and vice versa yeah. and so yep. forth. But, um, as Johnson bent to his task, he was aware that the old trapper's frosty stare was boring into his back. But he was an apt pupil, and now he cut as clean and sure as his teacher. As he snapped the trophy, Hatcher spoke in some doubt, 
Never scalped uh, a will. Yeah, never scalped an engine before, lad. Never seen one before. Then cuss me for a Kiowa. You're better built for this work than any man I ever seed. Mm. The old trapper looked off toward the mountains and added, First time I skinned a red coon, I was cold and shook all over. He turned to peel the remaining scalp, then watched as Johnson mounted his horse and looped the top knot through the, through the bridle. Basically, Jeremiah, or John Johnson, didn't give two craps. It wasn't yeah. at all perturbed right. by the sight and didn't feel sick or ill or anything. This guy talks like my cousin Ben. <laughs> um, that's for you, Ben. Oh. He says, uh, Slicing a man don't bother me none, said Johnson. And Hatcher was to remark later on his partner's expressionless eyes. John John Johnson is a different, you, different you, dude. Yes, like like you don't you don't just you're you don't just you're a Viking warrior yeah. in, in deep down in your yes. core or something. Like it's funny because he is a big white man. Yeah, giant. He's like a six foot something, two fifty pound. Like jo- Jeremiah Johnson is known as this massive right. white man. Yep. Um, that's a big dude. Just a big presence. Big dude. We all have seen some of these big ginger white guys. Um, so it says, um, Johnson did have enough sentiment. Can it be termed to save the scalp, uh, to save that first scalp of his own stretched on a hoop in his war bag. He identified it for white I Anderson in 1871. Hmm. So in 1871, he still had his very first scalp, scalp which he showed to White Eye Anderson. Hmm. We all have our first I, deer on the wall. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's oh, a little exactly. different than like... man hunting. Yeah. All right. Uh, if Hatcher taught Johnson how to kill Indians, he also taught him either the uh, he also taught him either the humanity or the profit of befriending at least some of them. He told, for example, a long and rambling tale of saving a Shoshone chief's young son from a lion, mountain lion, which had already cut and slashed the boy from ear to chin. Johnson would, in later years, recall this incident. Hmm. So, chapter three, an apprenticeship. When John Johnson went into the mountains with old Hatcher, beaver had virtually disappeared and trappers had to take lesser animals. Hudson Bay agents and the despised Boughton Frenchies uh, en- encroached more and more upon the mountain men trappers who prided themselves as white American freemen. Hatcher had specialized for years in the trapping of bear and mink, so he and Johnson went after these animals. Their years together shaped Johnson's whole career. Naturally, the latter devised his own skills, his surprise kicks, um, and developed his physical capacities notably his sense of smell he kicks like some kind of um kickboxing muay thai yeah. like like genius. a mule like <laughs> like his kicks are to yeah. kill men right um they're, they're legendary yep so you you figure if you can kick and you're you're athletic enough to perform those i've seen joe rogan kick a bag before yeah if a guy isn't prepared for that or doesn't know how to defend against it and you're that big and you hit somebody with your leg with that kind of well, power. the force that comes with it. And it keeps the person with the weapon further uh, away. Yeah, your yeah. leg reaches out a lot further. Yep. And you, I've seen the precision with which these UFC guys hit guys in the face, the guts, the like the way they kick. Yeah. Scary, scary. Yes. Kick yeah. in the head. like, And these guys don't see it coming. It's like... Yep. What a formidable weapon, actually, when you start using your well, legs. I'm and sure you know these times. That's not something you always see. Guys are fighting with their their hand and fist. Yeah, you know. I, I, so, um, continuing with the book, it says um, physical capacities. So he has this crazy sense of smell, like hmm. legendary sense of smell. Mm-hmm. Like he can smell like a bear or a dog. Right. So he can smell Indians when they're nearby. He can smell like. His sense of smell saves him over and over and over again. Well, you think about it. I mean, they're not taking showers all the time, stuff like that. And and you you think about coming up on a, a you elk just think or a wolf or something. Human senses being much more like your sense of smell. I'm sure in in before modern civilization was right. much more sensitive, right? Much less damaged, correct? From modern life, yep. Much more natural. All those sensory glands being 
you know, you we don't they don't I don't think they had allergies and no. things like we do right now because of poor gut health and and whatnot. Yep. But crazy sense of smell. And I remember being young and smelling oh, yeah. like elk. Oh my like, wife! My wife! Elk, elk! I can smell this elk. Is, this is no joke. I can't like, smell anything now. Anything my wife's like, what? I can't, what do you yeah. smell? Like she is on it, and I'm yeah. like, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? Absolutely, you especially know? when they're pregnant. Yes. Um, so it says, yet even though he improved on what others taught him from one thing, hatcher scalping technique, the fact remains that he was taught. His associate uh, associates in his first years in the mountains, Hatcher, Bill Williams, Bear Claw, Chris Lapp, and Del Gu, were, were remarkable men in their chosen field. The myth of liver eating Johnson presents no hero sprung forth, full developed, and ready for desperate adventures. Johnson learning was remarkably apt. He was a quick learner, but he mm-hmm. himself, in his own words, made clear the fact that he had he still had to learn. Yeah, and I say that all the time, like for me i've been fortunate with gritty as i started this and with gritty bowman i was able to just hunt with some of the best hunters in the world i've been able to travel on trips no i'm just kidding (laughs) and i've been i've learned how to shoot a bow from some of the the great teachers out there i've had access to people and when you do have the benefit of learning from somebody like that man it can completely change the trajectory of the rest of your life even filmmaking i learned from a few people things that changed my life in in that well, regard it, it speeds up your learning curve so much because all the mistakes that you would have made in between there are no longer yeah, made absolutely you know from the first of course he was quick-witted and powerful these were characteristic attributes Tra- trapping in the book cliff mountain region of the western slope he once saved hatcher's life so that's just north of utah right mm-hmm. in there and yeah. he talked about uintas as yeah. well wyoming um, Hatcher had wounded a grizzly, but the beast charging from close quarters allowed him no time for a second shot. Johnson fired at the bear, but succeeded only in wounding and further infuriating the gigantic beast. His only recourse with the, uh, being the knife, he drew his bowie and stepped between the bear and his partner, who was racing for the nearest tree. The grizzly, a huge male, at once faced its new antagon- antagonist, rearing up on its hind legs and lashing out with its terrible forepaws. Ducking under a raking sweep of the claws, Johnson drove his blade into the beast. Then the uh, the animal swayed to and fro, uh, and he raced for Hatcher's tree, leaving his knife in the bear. Mm. <laughs> Hatcher credited Johnson with presence of mind. Smart trick, said the old trapper as Johnson joined him in the tree. Leave the blade in her, the bear will die, bleed inside. Johnson might simply have ignored some general uh, tribute to his strength or bravery or general field tactics, but he refused his credit. There wasn't no time, he said, to pull the knife out. So, you know, um, you're talking, uh, it's hard to believe a man goes yeah. toe-to-toe with a bear with a knife. Right. But it's not impossible either because you see these things go down at times where um, it, they're stunned or shocked or something yeah. happens where you're like, what? Um the Indians tell of stories like this as well. It, it's hard for me to th- to fathom, but then you have Giannis Patelis whacking one on the nose with <laughs> right, a trekking, trekking pole, pole and it runs off. So. I mean, and there's five <laughs> other guys there to yeah, witness. Totally. It, you know? You're just like, well, he went toe to toe, and uh, it's it shocked the bear. He never even got a scratch right. on any of them. Right. And then oh, that situation rides it down the hill. So different. Oh yeah, they could all be just be uh, dead, right? Like weird things happen. Yep. But you gotta have. I mean. I think attacking definitely. I mean, Giannis kind of showed that fighting back or going at it kind of yeah. startled him somewhat. I don't know, crazy. Yep. Uh, Hatcher's cabin, to which he took young Johnson in their first trip together, was Little Snake Valley. Was in Little Snake Valley on the right river bank in what is now northwestern Colorado. Um, so not far from um, northeastern mm-hmm. and uh, the the bottom of Wyoming. Yep. The end of Utah. Utah. Southeast Utah. Yeah. And it says, um, uh, and into the cabin with the help of Hatcher's two Cheyenne squaws, they carried their first catch of furs from the Uintas. There, there Hatcher offered Johnson one of his women for, for the winter. And there he told his and the, the, the Valley's history of war, how Henry Frabe, old Frapp, 
died under Battle Mountain, pinned to a stump by a Cheyenne arrow in a battle between trappers and overwhelming mm. numbers of Indians. How Hatcher himself had fought in the famous engagement of Battle Creek. What's interesting is these mountain man stories, they don't have long and storied lives. Like no. they, they have short and storied lives. Like yep. generally they don't live very long. No, no. And so this is kind of a, a crazy, you know, lifestyle because it's what? what possesses a man to go do it. What, what possesses him to be alone, trap, be in the wild, constantly under threat of Indians and so on. Right. What is it? There's that, a lot. There's infection. There's predators. There's Indians. There's, there's so much. That... So what makes a man feel like all that adventure is worth it? Right. Yeah. When the cost is so high. Yeah. Potential cost. Because eventually they might live to 35, but they generally, or 40, but they generally, when they finally get got, it yeah, ain't pretty. No. It's no. like skinned alive, tortured, entrails tied to a pony, whipped around the, Gosh. like you're talking like some morbid deaths. I don't know. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. It, later in the book, and I'll just skip ahead because it, it had me thinking for the past few weeks after I finished the book. At one point, you know, as civilization is rolling in mm -hmm. and the trapping and everything in, in the world is changing, the wild places aren't so wild anymore. You're, the Indians are on reservations. Yeah. He says to one of the trappers one day, he said, living here, living won't have much meaning to it mm -hmm. when I'm not, when there's not someone here trying to kill me. And I'm not forced to defend yeah. it. Like they're so used to being hunted all the time well, and hunting and others that it gives their life, makes them feel alive every yeah. day. Well, I was, was going to say that is, you know, when we go on a 10 day hunt and we're remote and the phone's off, like, yeah, mm -hmm. we still have some technology. We still text through the internet, whatever. But I was, I was talking to this to one of my friends that doesn't hunt. And it's like that reconnection that we get to nature. I mean, we're out there living. True. You are, everything you There's, have is in your backpack and you're re reconnecting with nature. I can relate. I can. I can relate to that, relate to, to the peace that comes from being yeah. out there. But also, can you imagine that every turn we're also on the verge of being hunted and killed right. by, by other people that are out there? Right. That's a whole nother it, level oh, yeah. of, oh, yeah. and then you have to do hand to hand combat. Yes. You have to get into matches where you actually kill other people or be killed. Yes. But that's just normal. That's just a day in the life, right? For for these guys. Well, and, you and think, I think about it. I mean, we're no different because you take. And I, I'm not a military guy. I've never been mm -hmm. served in the military. I appreciate those that have. And and you talk to those guys. Yeah. And it, they don't think twice about it. There's a switch in your body that just turns on, and where it's it's live or die. True. You know, and and so I think it's it's just in human nature. But we have over time, we have gotten away from that because we are so civilized, you know, and, and you come into the cities and people that don't go out and spend five or 10 days, they, they lose yeah, the disconnect. But, but would you like, we seek safety. There's a certain degree of security yes. that we're seeking. Like yeah. I have no interest in going to like, I don't know, Iraq to hunt right. Ibex. Right. <laughs> like, right. See, like, I do, but like, it's like, no, the risk ain't worth the reward. Yeah. yeah. I'm not Jim Shockey. Uh, but what I'm saying is like, we seek safety. Yeah. At a different level, because what 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 they're saying is they have their life feels more alive and meaningful for the fact that they're always under constant threat and might die. Yeah, it's like living on the edge. That is different. I can't say I re, I can I don't yeah. I I can I can intellectually consider it and understand the concept, but I I actually can't relate to it necessarily. Well, I mean. And it's, I think it's really hard for us to relate to that because we're in totally different times. But it did, it did, you know? it did say something to me though. Like they, they believed in the idea of being in the wild mm -hmm. and they didn't want it a different way. Yeah. They didn't want to live in a country where they were safe. Well, they, I, they, they literally are saying, I don't want to live like that. I want to live by my wits yep. and I want to be hunted and I want to hunt, hunt on my own. I like. I want to live in a world where, where there's d constant danger, and I overcome. Yeah, and I, and I think we our scale of that is very, very small compared to that. But we yeah. still do. I mean, you go out to yeah. 
Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, those places with grizzlies. I don't know. It's, it's, a, it's, it's very, it's a true. It's very small scale. It's a different, like being hunted by a grizzly and being hunted by a man are oh, yeah. like totally different. Oh yeah, they are. They are. Man, human beings are ruthless. But we're seeking adventure. They can be great, but they can be just horrible. Yes. But anyway, so he says, um, Johnson refused Hatcher's offer of the squaw. Indeed, in what he himself must have surely regarded as an excess of delicacy, he built himself a separate accommodation, a lean-to on the side of the cabin, and and, uh, and that was good enough for him. And he did not take he did not take uh, his squaw. And um, other trappers passing through these mountains came by way of Little Snake to visit their old comrade Hatcher. And here, Johnson met many shrewd and famous characters, men of long experience, and he was to observe how many of them died violently ere they could not make another such visit. Hmm. Visiting with a, with an old friend was a pleasure worth weeks of hardship and deadly peril, but parting was casual, as even death amidst such everyday hazards was matter of fact. It's a totally different... And I think our society is really hurting yeah. right now because of the fact that on general, on mass, we seek safety. Safety yes. is more important to to look at the the whole pandemic thing. It's it was more about safety than freedom. Yes. More about safety than adventure. More yep. about safety than risk. More about safety than living. Yeah. And this this weird, bizarre fear of dying drives me nuts because yep. I hop in a tiny little bucket plane and I fly through the mountains in a storm to land out in the middle of nowhere and then live off my wits and what's in my backpack for yeah. 14 days, yeah. kill stuff and then come home. Like safety isn't, I, I, I'm trying to, to, I want to come back, yep. you know, but at the same time I want to live. But in going back to that, what I was saying is like, when you come back, from living out of your backpack for 10 days. Oh, you're way more year. alive. You are, you're so more alive, so much more alive. My and relationships you, are better. Relationships are better and your appreciation for everything. My appreciation is, for everything is better. Yes. My wife, my family, my kids, like it, it changes your, it changes you. Yeah. You know, I was listening to, uh, Huberman, um, I'm drawing a blank on his first name, Dr. Huberman Yeah. on a podcast. I've been really enjoying his stuff. It was really interesting because he talks about um, how hormones work in men. Yep. And when men leave, and women as well, when a man and a woman separate, which has been sort of the norm since the beginning of time. Right. Because men have to go out, they hunt, kill, they hunt, ride. do things, yep. and then come back. And women stayed home and raised the young and stuff, and there was, there was times apart. Mm -hmm. Even in this colonial time, early on, you had men would go for months, six months, months a yes. year out and then they'd come back and their wives were in the city living there and he talks about when men leave their hormone levels like switch around they're 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 they go through periods where um like when you are when you first met your your wife and fell in love and you guys were first married and so on there's this there's this intense courtship and mm -hmm. and this desire to be together and this strong sexual experiences yep. and all, all of this stuff, this bonding that comes is physical and these all these urges are super potent. Yep. And the longer you're together, the more you're with each other every day. Hormonally, those things drop off. Yep. They drop off dramatically, in right. fact. And so when you leave and you part with each other, all those hormones and stuff, the physiological change occurs. Yeah. All of a sudden, how much you yearn for your wife, for example, goes up dramatically. Yes. And the more you're apart, the same happens to her. Yep. And there's this longing to then reunite. And then when you reunite, you experience a, an interaction that you, you otherwise could go years without mm -hmm. experiencing right. if you were just together day in and day out, day in and day out. Well, and I think too, that's why they always say is, even, and it's it's not easy, especially with kids mm -hmm. and stuff. Is they always tell you continue to date your wife. Yeah, because it makes it so hard when you when you there you're is married and you you lose when, when you lot. do that. There is a concerted effort to take care of the one you love. Yes, when you when you put in the effort and you're thoughtful about it, mm -hmm. but there's almost like a a physiological yeah 
causation of that if you just spent time apart. Exactly. Where where it's like you just you date automatically because all the hormones and everything yep. everything is there rather than you're doing it because it's more of an intellectual thing that you yep. know you need to yep. do. I know that when I return from being gone about a month, the longer I'm away, the more I appreciate everything about the woman I married. <laughs> 100%. And the more I appreciate everything about my children, the more I I my affection grows mm-hmm. greatly. And it's so easy, I think, to take for granted when you're just together every day. Well, and I, I will add this. This is it may, not, may not be for everybody as well, but when I'm coming back, it's also a touchy subject. Like I have to be careful too, tread lightly, is because you know I got away from the three hellions. Yeah, just being so crazy, the kids, you know. And so it's it's your wife adapts to life without you. Yes. And then you come in and they're like, I got used to you being gone. Yeah. You know, yeah. It's like, and so it's like you touch your water, you know, because she's been with the kids every day dealing with that. And yeah. So it's, it's you got to tread lightly. So um, we'll read a little bit more. Uh, he says, uh, among the visitors that came to the cabin was Bearclaw or Chris Lapp, mm-hmm. one of the best of mountain men and a survivor of Sublet's band when Hatcher, as often, rode off on a one man venture. This this time to Ben's Fort on Arkansas with several packs of furs, Johnson trapped with Bear Claw. So Bear Claw is a famous trapper as mm-hmm. well, yep. uh, who dies an ignominious death years and years later. Yep. And uh and you're gonna learn about that and then Jeremiah or John Johnson's reaction to that, Liver Eaton John's reaction to to his friend's uh death as Bear Claw becomes a more and more part big part of the story. But it says, um, Despite Johnson's reputation for surliness, the two became good friends. Um, Bearclaw could tell the younger man his own colorful history, um, but didn't have to explain his nickname because old Chris delighted in making necklaces of bear claws, and other hunters throughout the West saved such trophies for his collection. Using only the claws of grizzlies, sometimes as many as 25 sets to the ornament, he matched and polished like a craftsman handling purest gems. The claws from one of Johnson's first grizzlies being presented to Chris by Hatcher. The mountain artisan proclaimed his thanks for exactly as prophesied. Great Jehoshaphat, Pocahontas, and John Smith. The hunter who drew Chris's most astonished praise for the, his offering felt rewarded indeed. Hmm. Um, I need one of those necklaces. Yeah, no kidding. We I, need, we need I, to start I've been one. collecting jars of bear claws um yeah i got a jar of, of black bear um and uh i think ryan has quite a few as well but it's one of those things i'm like man we've taken so many bears and we have so many bears in the future as we eat so much bear yeah uh and i'm kind of i'm running out of space for bear hides so at this point i'm ready to start just collecting claws, claws. Are a little smaller. yeah claws and the skull maybe yeah so um, like on my bear i didn't want to take the claws off and so like but on ryan's bear he was like, I got so many, you know, I'm just going to take what I need. And, and I was like, well, I'm still on a claw for my kids so they can have it, you know, because I don't want to use the one off of mine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because he's, he's too pretty. But. Um, he talks about how they were out and he talks about how culture had run a hundred miles from the Indians. Mm-hmm. So there's that famous story, uh, trapper Coulter. What was his first name? Well, he got caught and then he had to escape. Are you talking bear claw? No, Coulter. Oh, oh Coulter, Coulter. Yeah, yeah. Um, run 100 miles from them. Um, why Why did he need to run? It was as much as Chris could do to persuade his young comrade that a man might sometimes do well to run from an enemy, even from the whole fighting force of a tribe. On that same journey, Chris and Johnson found Bill Williams camped on the Sweetwater. And so he meets Bill Williams. So this is the story of how he kind of comes to know as a, as a greenhorn, mm-hmm. all these influential trappers that start to teach him. Now, obviously, obviously he had like an insane natural yeah, ability, a knack for it. Uh, drive temperament. Like he was made to be a mountain man. Yeah. You know, yep. this is, this is his element. He's not trying to squeeze himself into something. Right. He's like living his destiny. He's living out his natural being, you know? Yep. Um, so, Anyway, we're not going to get into uh, the rest. We're going to start the next chapter here on the next episode. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this one. We kind of bounced around a little bit. 
um, as there was a lot to lay down for context. We'll get into the next episode. We'll get deeper into the stories and mm-hmm. kind of flow a little more. But hope you, hopefully you enjoyed it. Um, if you did, like and comment, subscribe to the channel, leave us a comment. Yep. And uh, check out the description field of all of our YouTube videos where you can find all the partners that we work with. And uh, use the code Gritty over there at Stealthy Hunter. Mountain Ops, Peaks, yep. Initial Go hunt, Ascent, maps. Go Hunt, all those partners. If you're, in, if you're in need of some gear like that, shop over there. It helps us out. And uh, yeah, thanks for tuning in. Stay gritty.